Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, our next session will be Sean Thomas from Second Quadrant talking about empty databases. All right, am I on? Looks like I'm on. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to get too formal here. We're uh, obviously uh, a small, tight-knit group here, so uh, we can be a little more intimate than usual. Um, so normally, uh, so who am I? I'm the, I'm the high availability guy. Uh, I work for Second Quadrant. Uh, I build up a very long uh, repertoire of high availability tricks um, and tips and stuff. And while this isn't my usual topic, I figured, you know, sometimes there's beginner stuff that we need to kind of go over and maybe not so beginner stuff that would be kind of a cool use case. Uh, so uh, I came across this and thought it was a really cool idea. And, you know, so why we're we here? Um, why would an empty database be good? Why is it useful? I have a lot of ideas on this, and I even gave a webinar on it uh, to a certain extent, uh, I think sometime last year. Uh, I really liked it. The topic was one of my favorites, and I think it's underutilized in the uh, realm of Postgres in general. So why else are we here? Because uh, maybe, maybe I'm speaking too much for all of us when I say we hate ETL, but I certainly dislike it to a high extent. Uh, and I'm also a filthy liar. Please uh, don't take anything I say in here as gospel. Don't even listen to what I'm saying right now. But uh, I guess technically metadata counts as data. So we're not really empty. So I'm going to go over a few topics here. It's not just you know a uh, one-trick pony. I'm going to go over some foreign data wrappers, um, functions, views, materialized views, anything that doesn't really count as data but may exist in your database to facilitate access to other things. Uh, I thought about actually creating a slide for this uh, and just to list all the different uh, categories of foreign data wrappers, but. Uh, I figured just a huge, ridiculous list of them would be a good start. I, I actually also wanted to write a, uh, or grab a foreign data wrapper of foreign data wrappers to display a select statement of all the foreign data wrappers to kind of uh, increase the meme potential. But what's really going on here is uh, we've got a, an endlessly growing list of foreign data wrappers that allow us to facilitate data from uh, basically everything. Uh, I, I kind of want to write a foreign data wrapper called kitchen sink wrapper, uh, K, uh, KSW, I guess you could call it and then uh, use it to access something ridiculous like uh, the, a cat bowl or something that distributes uh, food to your cat and you can find out the frequency of it or something based on the times your cat goes to eat the food. You know, you can write a foreign data wrapper for anything and why not that too? So I'm gonna build something horrifying. Uh, it's going to be an unholy amalgam on the level of Cthulhu. Uh, I'm going to combine Postgres, MySQL, uh, uh, another Postgres node for why not more Postgres. Uh, I'm going to create a REST interface. I'm going to combine our external scripts, some, you know, some Python magic, and MongoDB into one giant unholy mess. Because why not? We all want to have all those things in a single database, don't we? Uh, so first I'm going to do, I'm going to start with some Postgres. Because why not more Postgres? We all come here for Postgres. This is a Postgres conference. So I'm going to write Postgres in Postgres using Postgres uh, and demo it with Postgres. And if there's some way I could use the Postgres and make it an acronym that said Postgres for every letter, I would do that as well. So what I'm doing here um, is I'm just going to create, and this is going to be a very familiar table because I'm going to use it a lot in this demonstration. Uh, it's just a simple table. Uh, it's got four wimpy little columns, and I'm filling it with a uh, generate series statement, and it's got a couple of indexes. Nothing crazy, you know, when I analyze it because that's good practice, right? Got to make sure your uh, statistics are in there so you get good query plans on your simulated four-column table. Uh, this is going to be the other table we connect to from our empty database. This is going to be on some other database. I called it extra. 
because why not? And here's the foreign data wrapper portion. Uh, and that's all that goes into it. Um, you, you create the extension, you create the server to actually get the data from it, and like I said, it's, ex ex it's extra. Uh, I'm from some other database, I'm connecting to the extra one. Um, you, and at least in my case, I'm trying to be clean about this. I'm create a, creating a schema specifically to import all those tables into, because that's also good practice is encapsulation using namespacing. And that was it. I had a foreign data wrapper to Postgres. So now we're going to move on to MySQL because MySQL has a lot of things that it can't do and Postgres can. So why don't we make MySQL better by making it Postgres? So similar process as we did with Postgres, we create uh, the doomed alien you know, node from our uh, previous slide. Uh, and it also has a four column simulated table, table of sensor log and it's got a couple of indexes, but notice two things are missing. I didn't bootstrap the table and, well obviously I didn't analyze it. And then it also has a second step to import into, into my Postgres shell database, okay? Uh, again, I create the extension, I create the server, I create the user mapping to make sure I can connect to that server, I create a, sch a schema to contain everything, and then I slurp it in, right? Import foreign schema, very handy. That didn't exist in the first iteration. But remember, we didn't bootstrap the table until now. So I actually am inserting into the sensor log uh, of the MySQL shell portion using uh, a Postgres function generate series, which doesn't exist in MySQL. MySQL literally has no way of generating uh, rows. You actually, uh, I, had, I looked for like an hour on this and I was shocked every time I couldn't find an answer. The only way you can do it in MySQL is to um, write your own uh, CTE or you create a query that, that selects from a subquery of itself and then generates rows that way in a kind of like a nested loop kind of thing. Why? I can just use Postgres. So I, I just use Postgres to fill a table in MySQL and notice, okay, so the second column here, the location ID being two, that's very important. It'll come up later. Postgres was one, obviously. MySQL is now two. And I figure, Now's a good time for an intermission, right? Uh, I couldn't find one of an of a, uh, elephant eating a snake, but uh, this works too. We're combining two things, two great tastes that taste great together. So Python, this code I think believes, uh, it deserves a little bit of explanation. So uh, is anyone here not know Python? or at least understand the pseudocode-ish of Python. So you can see all I'm really doing is uh, I've got a function, okay? It's reading proc mem info. It's grabbing the, um, like the descriptor, which is like you know, the amount of memory that's currently dirty, and then it's grabbing the number of kilobytes or whatever that is, splitting those two apart, and then returning those as columns. So I've got my, my, uh, my label for my memory item, and then the reading that it's currently showing from the kernel. And then I'm reading it from proc mem info because the proc um, system in Linux is awesome. And this function now is a view into proc mem info. Okay? And this bottom part is something I recommend everybody do at all circumstances anytime they do something with uh, one of these functions up here. Because in Postgres, every function gets created with um, public uh, execution rights automatically, which I personally consider a execution bug or, or a, a security flaw. Um, so every time you create a function, always include a revoke all just as a matter of course, uh, especially on Python because it's an untrusted language. Uh, does anyone know what an untrust, not know what an untrusted language is? Okay, so uh, an untrusted language means 
it's not trusted by Postgres because it can do anything. Like it can uh, invoke shared libraries from outer space. It can run commands that can erase your file system. It's, it can delete the cluster, uh, right? So it's, it's untrusted, it's basically God in a box, and I just put it as a function in Postgres. So if, there's an ex if there's some kind of weird exploit here, then theoretically someone could root the box or whatever if they have access to the Postgres server. So make sure you lock it down, make sure that only certain users can access this function, uh, and at the very least, make sure that anyone that can connect to the database can't execute it, right? But don't get too excited. Like I'd mentioned, uh, this is a really super dangerous thing to do. Um, I don't recommend it as general course unless you really know what you're doing or have a lockdown database in general. Uh, in fact, you probably won't have access to untrusted uh, languages in your database uh, unless you are the DBA or you have access to the DBA or you can browbeat the DBA or you have some kind of blackmail for the DBA. Um, but either way, always make sure to include that explicit grant and revoke because you want to make sure the only people you know or have blackmail material on you can access that function. Uh, and now, we're going to make things even stranger. So who, who knows what REST is? Who does not know what REST is? Uh, so uh, I guess uh, REST is a mechanism for invoking remotely various kinds of uh, functions or actions uh, through usually um, some kind of message passing structure uh, uh, through a socket. Usually it's JSON through a web inter a portal of some kind. Uh, and it's an API because, you know, it, it's, a, it's a publicly exposed way of invoking actions. Uh, but I don't really think it's what you'd normally consider an API because it's not a library you include, it's not like a thing you do, and it's constantly in flux. But I guess it's technically something you can invoke, and it's got like you know some kind of documented calls usually, uh, and an interface language you can use. So uh, this is another very simple Python example. I'm not I'm not crazy here. I'm not a coder. I'm not doing anything ridiculous. Uh, all this does is uh, Falcon is just like a, a Python thing for uh, making web services. Um, I'm creating a, a dictionary of every word in a, in a Linux dictionary, because most Linux installations have user share dict words, which is basically just a one column listing of every word in the English language. It's, I don't know why it's there, honestly, it just is in most cases. Uh, but it's very handy if you want to use it for fake data. Uh, but it's also really handy for demonstrative purposes, and uh, if you just want to look stuff up, you can grep or whatever. Oh, what was that word? Oh, yeah. Um, and then the other stuff is just Falcon. So the real guts of this function is just um, the, the dictionary there. And then that class index is, another fal is a Falcon way of saying, okay, if someone asks the Falcon REST API for the index object, it will return the dictionary. So it's basically a way of turning the, uh, the Linux dictionary into a JSON list of words. Nothing really complicated. And I, I admit there's probably an easier way to do this. Um, but we're trying to be fancy here. And then multi-corn, there's actually another um, foreign data wrapper talk that I was listening to. I kind of walked in a little bit to, she talked about, uh, yes, uh, I wonder where that came from. So uh, there was another foreign data wrapper talk that was also going over uh, multi-corn. Well, multi-corn is basically a way of saying, I don't know, I don't have a foreign data wrapper for this, so I'll make one. Well, obviously there's no foreign data wrapper for uh, getting the list of dictionary words out of Linux, so I made one. Uh, and all this really does is it connects to that port 9999 that I exposed in uh, Falcon, and it says, okay, give me that index um, API call, and then it gets that um, one col sorry, two column listing of words, because I gave it an ID number, so each word is numbered for some reason. Uh, and now it sends back uh, a two-column list of for, for row and data of all the records in the, in the call to the Falcon object. Gives me basically an ID and a name or uh, and a word for the dictionary. So this is the entire foreign data wrapper. It's like 10 lines of Python, okay? Nothing complicated. We're not programmers in here. We're, we're DBAs and Postgres people, right?
Uh, and then the same thing I did with Postgres and MySQL, create the extension, create the server, um, create the schema, and then create the, uh, the foreign table itself. Now, unlike the previous foreign uh, table examples I had with MySQL and Postgres, I can't import this object because there's no introspection module. There, there may be one in, in multi-core and I could write like a, you know, a, a class for it that would actually introspect and automatically return the data structure that you would request, but that's way more complicated than we want to get here, okay? We're just doing a demo. So for right now, I'm just gonna define my two, two column table of ID and words since I know what those are. And now we have a table that is a representation. I can select from that table and get all the words in the uh, dictionary on the Linux web server that I'm on right now or wherever that port 9999 uh, goes uh, for the rest call. So I could point it at a dictionary in Helsinki and get the you know, German words for, or whatever. Um, and that's not the exciting part. So MongoDB, uh, I, I would say it's our favorite whipping boy, but there's, there's my sequel still. Um, so does anybody know what, uh, not know what MongoDB is? Okay, good, good. That means we all are familiar with the fact that this, uh, we don't really know if we're actually saving our data or if it's going to some other location of undetermined uh, circumstance. And again, I'm going to bootstrap a MongoDB um, kind of thing for fun. Uh, and oddly enough, creating uh, tables in MongoDB is easier than MySQL or Postgres because <laughs> they're not only really tables. They're just like a thing that holds stuff. And you'd think I'm being um, obtuse about that, but no, I'm probably being too descriptive. Thing and stuff are far too precise. And again, I'm not bothering to bootstrap the table because I don't know JSON. Are you kidding me? I work with SQL all day long. Uh, so, you know, standard steps, create the extension, create the server, create the user mapping, but the table's a little more involved this time. Boy, oh boy. So I actually have to create the table because, well, we all know that Mongo has no columns, so I've gotta make them up, right? And then uh, the database that I'm in right now, uh, I created the PG Open database because, you know, we're Postgres Open, might as well be topical. And it's still a sensor log table using the camel caps that uh, Mongo prefers. And so this, this ID column here is gonna be significant, that very top one underscore ID. The Mongo foreign data wrapper requires it um, because Mongo itself has its own internal uh, reference for the ID object that, so it knows how to do the lookup of that particular document. Um, and I didn't want to reuse it because it's like a long string of like, it's a UUID thing. So uh, I personally didn't want that, mix that in with my other IDs uh, for this demonstration. And also it helps serve a, an important purpose later. Uh, and again, just like the MySQL example, I don't care what my remote system can do because Postgres has its own stuff and I can just use that. I'm a Postgres guy, I'm gonna use Postgres. I don't know JSON, I'm going to bootstrap the table using Postgres, okay? Same generate series that I did before the first two times. Uh, the only difference here again, Mongo is three, so we've got one, two, and three uh, things plugged into our shell database now. Uh, is that clear so far? I'm not doing anything stupid yet? Okay, we're not to the fun parts anyway. All right, what do we have so far? I love that image in general, even, even though I've Photoshopped it badly. Um, so we've got, you know, MySQL and, uh, you know, Postgres and uh, that REST interface thing and uh, Multicorn and Python. Yeah, that's the Python logo. Um, and I could have put, honestly, I could have put more things in there, right? Uh, she knows. Uh, I could have put in like, you know, 20 or 30 more. But, you know, this is a conference. I, I can't put slides on there for every possible combination. And uh, there's really only so many ways I can say the same thing, really. Uh, I don't want to make you bored. You're already bored. Um, okay, now we're going to get to the fun stuff. 
So I am not satisfied just getting the stuff into Postgres. It's useless to me that way uh, because I'm lazy. Okay, Postgres 11 uh, has done some, 10 and 11 have done some really cool things for me and I wanna make use of them. So I'm gonna create a native Postgres partition. Uh, notice I only have those first four columns and I'm partitioning by the location ID. Why did I partition by the location ID? Well, those are all my external locations, okay? I've got my SQL, um, that, that can be an external partition. Mongo can be an external partition. Uh, Postgres can be my other external partition. And I'm gonna do that right now. All right, first I reach out to Postgres because it's the first one. Um, all I do is I attach a partition, right, for, for, for value number one. Because I partitioned it on location, so location ID number one is my first partition. Do it again with my SQL. Sensing a pattern here. Mongo's a little bit different. And this is the part that I kind of wanted to point out. So if I try this with Mongo, uh, Postgres partitions do not allow extra columns. Why do you ask? I personally have no clue. Because the old way of doing partitions using table inheritance did let you have extra columns. So personally, I think this is a, this is a tiny step backwards in that regard, right? Because if I want to query the partition itself and not have to do the root table, I would run into a problem. Because like using the old partition style, I could add like 20 extra columns and as long as I target the child table, I could get those columns and it wouldn't be a deal. Uh, it wouldn't be a big problem. But with Postgres native partitioning syntax, you can't do that. So I, I have an issue now, because Mongo forced me to have that extra underscore ID column. What do I do with that? Uh, I gotta do something if I wanna use that in my, my shell database. So I cheat. So one of the things you can do with Postgres, which is a horrifying hack, I recommend you do not do, except because I'm going to do it and don't say I'm a huge hypocrite. Uh, I'm going to create a view on my Mongo table where I'm going to erase that column. That column doesn't exist. There's no more underscore ID column. Then I'm going to create a loopback server because everyone loves the loopback device where I just connect to myself. So my, my, my PG open uh, database now where the shell database is and on localhost, port 5432, my local database, not the extra one where I have the Postgres uh, center log table. I'm connecting to this, the same database where I'm putting all this stuff. And then I'm creating user mapping for the table, obviously. And then I'm gonna recreate the Mongo table without my stupid underscore ID column. Then I can attach it to the partition set. So what do I have here now? I've got a partition with, uh, a table from Postgres, a table from MySQL, and then a reference to a view to a table in MongoDB. Still none of my own tables. This is all empty still. <laughs> now, some people might question my methods. Uh, that's probably a good idea. What I'm doing right now is completely unwarranted and I highly don't recommend that you do any of these things on your own, except that I am recommending it because reasons. So, I'm gonna let you absorb all that for a while and go back to our, our old dictionary friend. Uh, so, one, I guess, drawback to this approach of reaching out externally to everything is everything you reach out to externally is trash. You just gotta assume it's garbage. Uh, in this case, my dictionary object, uh, reading uh, 30,000 lines from the operating system, turns out it's kind of slow. Uh, you know, it takes about a second, a little over a second, to get all of the words from my dictionary through my REST interface, my HTTP interface through multicorn to a file on disk. Who knew that was an, an unoptimal way of doing things? So how do I fix that? Well. One of the ways I like to use materialized views is to hide bad things from, from myself. So I'm just gonna create a cache, essentially. Uh, I'm gonna create a materialized view for, this, for, my, for my REST interface. I'm going to index it because word pattern ops and other cute little tricks like that work a lot better in Postgres. And I'm gonna analyze it because I wanna have my stats so I can do this. Oh look, 
I've gone down from 1.3 seconds to less than one millisecond. And I ran that multiple times to obviously prove it. We all knew this would happen anyway. Indexes are much better than reading a web interface through a REST API calls to a 60,000 line file on disk. No surprise there. But I did a search for the word fun and I came out with a bunch of stuff in less than a millisecond. Can't beat that. But this is illustrative of the fact that, uh, you know, I can use this materialized view trick on anything. Uh, I can use it on the Mongo database object. Um, I can restrict it to like say today's data. I can say select from, you know, I can create a view of select star from this thing for a day, make that the base of my materialized view and refresh that on a regular basis. And suddenly my useless shell database has useful things I, in it that I care about. All right, so what are the benefits of this approach? So first of all, these aren't our tables. We're, we stole them outright. They're someone else's, they're ours now. Um, and I demonstrated we could write to the external sources, at least some foreign data wrappers allow you to do this. Uh, fortunately, MySQL and uh, MongoDB are among them. Uh, I believe even Oracle allows us to write to it remotely, which is very magnanimous of them given Oracle's track record. Um, and obviously we can read from all the sources, which is important because, uh, well, with multi-corn, at the very least, we can write a foreign data wrapper for anything, even if we're complete idiots, yours truly. Uh, and, you know, why not make a multi-corn foreign data wrapper for uh, your ring doorbell? Now, I hear filthy rumors that multi-corn is not actively developed. That obviously is not the case, or I couldn't have got this whole demonstration functional on a Postgres 12 beta installation. <laughs> now, it's probably true that I probably couldn't have done anything more useful than a one function API call that I did with this 10 line example that I had. If I tried anything more complicated, it probably would have blown up in my face, so I didn't notice it wasn't actively developed. But that's just more, I guess, incentive to try to make sure that multi-corn doesn't die because it's honestly the easiest way to create a foreign data wrapper. It just is. Uh, like, I barely know how to type words on a computer, uh, and I did that. So, you know, if that's possible, imagine what someone who's competent could do. Uh, and, you know, there you go. So what is this for? Why did I make this presentation? Essentially what it boils down to are these points here. So say I want to uh, wash my hands of all this external database stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you all the stuff you keep asking for to shut you up. BI department, all you guys writing reports or, you know, uh, fact tables or star schemas, whatever. Here, you have access to everything. Have fun, knock yourself out. Uh, just write queries for it. Um, I can feed it into a, a, a reporting database. I can just select star from all that stuff. Now Postgres is my ETL. And using foreign data wrappers again, I could slurp from some ex a bunch of external sources and spew it back into some other external sources. Postgres is now a middle shim layer to everything from everything. And the best part about that is, uh, you know, you can even replace a lot of regular code with it. Uh, you no longer have to do, if you have like a uh, shell script or whatever, or, or something that selects from a database, goes through a loop, selects from some other thing, combines it, selects from some other thing, combines that, creates a temporary file at the end, and then uses a giant copy statement to put it somewhere else. No. One query into this shell game of ours has an immediate output of all the fields you're interested in. So you've simplified your life to a high extent. Uh, and that, that's why I say you deprecate some ETL tools, because a lot of those things like, uh, you know, I'm was it a, uh, I should have come up with a name of a list of all the major ETL tools, but uh, I know a lot of them are like, you know, oh, plug, plug in all these things and you can run them in parallel and uh, they have all these crazy interfaces and they're in Java and they're, you know, they, 
they cost millions of dollars. Um, we actually evaluated a whole bunch uh, in my in a company I was at uh, in 2008 and 2009. And we even had one of their sales guys come in. Well, you know what? If I had all this back then, I would've been like, no, we'll just do it in Postgres. Uh, and, you know, again, you can slurp in the data, put it in some other Postgres system. Doesn't matter, use your imagination, whatever you want. All right, so takeaways. This is the meat of the presentation. Uh, seems silly, but it's true. Right, we only have to know SQL, okay? This is important. I, at least, uh, since I've been doing this stuff for 20 years, I've forgotten every other language I know. I barely know how to read code anymore. Uh, it took me a week to relearn Python. Uh, I've forgotten all the stuff I learned in college. I'm just, a, I just SQL, I've, I've specialized too much, okay? And you know what, it doesn't matter now, because I can do it in Postgres, right? And Postgres is the API, okay? Uh, if I don't know Python or Multicorn or C or some other way of interfacing with something, uh, I can you know, go into our uh, company and be like, does anybody know how to read and write from this thing? Can you generate output in a CSV format at least? Uh, can you make it web available with an API call? Can I, can I grab it somehow? Uh, then I can make it into a thing that I can pull into Postgres. The rest doesn't matter. Uh, you, can, you can write a wrapper, a file wrapper at the most, or sorry, at the least for anything. Uh, I've, I, I wrote a, uh, you know, back in 99, 2000, I wrote uh, a thing I called Atom, a tool for um, automatic um, materialization. And it was basically for uh, turning random data into some, uh, a standard driver format. So essentially, it, it was for classified ads for vehicles. And when we were interfacing with co external customer systems, like they had an inventory of cars they wanted to send us, it came in like 80 different formats. And I'm like, I can't import this into our system. I have to write a driver for everything. So what I wrote is a system that takes, it reads into any file format, converts it into some kind of intermediate layer that is recognized by our system, and then spits that into it. So I only had to write uh, a major, kind of like a driver level um, adapter for like 10 things, and then I was done. So for this, I could do something similar. I would just write you know, my, my adapter levels, my foreign data wrapper plugins, um, put them in this, and suddenly now I just have Postgres as my interface layer. I didn't have to write that whole uh, translation mechanism. I could have just written a foreign data wrapper for all those things. And I can secure these resources, right? So since I have this shell database, I can use grant revoke statements and create users for them and create my own ACLs. And if I give someone access to the shell system, uh, and, and they don't even have to know these external resources exist. They just know if they select star from you know, whatever table, they get some result output back, or they may not have access to it because it's not, not been granted to them. So, I can put grant statements on a flat text file that I have sitting on a server somewhere, uh, and nobody has to know about it but me, and whoever created the server resource for me. And with enough obfuscation, anything is possible. Uh, I can encrypt the file system, I can do a bunch of other stuff and add translation layers and further complicate my life, but in the end, the only way of getting to the data would be through this foreign data wrapper Postgres shell system. And again, none of the data is in the actual database, so, Uh, any time that anyone tries to interface with this, um, they're no longer using their own kind of homebrew stuff, okay? So like an example I gave earlier where they've got like a, a for loop that's um, you know, pulling in from a, like a data file and then combining other, in, other resources into some final result and then that's what they're using for their data. Well, that's basically just emulating set theory you're doing a nested loop manually with code, which is awful and slow and horrible, and never, never ever do that. Databases are designed for set theory. They do combinations of sets, that's their whole job. Why not let them do it? Okay, once you have the foreign data wrappers in there, they do all the hard heavy lifting, and you don't have to reinvent set theory, you don't have to write a SQL interpreter, you don't have to do all the hard work, Postgres does it for you.
And again, because you know, I've got to reiterate these points. Um, how many people here? Okay, how many people here have had? Um, I guess uh, an app dev or someone else that's got like uh, some uh, gross app that's you know using a for loop or something and looping through SQL results. Okay, we've all encountered it, right? So, what, how how nice would it be to say, don't do that, just use this instead? Um, and like I said earlier, sometimes those are a join uh, to create external resources. They're creating their, their own Postgres form data wrapper through code. Like maybe it's Python, maybe it's PHP, maybe it's you know, some web page somewhere. And they're just going out and getting all these external resources when they could just go to the one place that matters, Postgres. And you know, that's what Postgres does best, so why not let it do it? Um, there's all the stuff I used uh, to get this information uh, to build slides. Uh, really nothing complicated. Um, and again, I just wanted to emphasize that I'm here mainly advocating that uh, while you may not emulate my methods, uh, like don't you know reach out to MongoDB and MySQL and and other things like Oracle and just combine them indiscriminately. You know, have some uh, rhyme to your reason. But at the same time, uh, did I miss a slide somewhere? Because I swear that I had another one on what? No, no, I missed, there's a slide that just vanished. I'll figure out how that happened. So I do remember the slide that vanished though. Um, let's go back to the, uh, all right, so the slide that vanished were, was basically related to why would I do this horrible thing? Uh, well, the main ideas I came up with, um, and there's really no end to them. Um, so say you have a, uh, well, no, I, I did go through that, didn't I? The BI team thing. That was just earlier than it was supposed to be. Uh, well, in that case, forget, I, I came up with that aside. Either way, uh, I'm basically done. I went through that much faster than I thought I would because uh, I guess it was a very short uh, presentation. But uh, I tried to follow the two minute per slide rule and I had way more slides than that. I thought I would actually go over time. So uh, I guess I have lots of time for questions or you can leave early. Um, it's up to you. Are there any questions, comments, Rotten Tomatoes? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, there's a general word for this, which is federation, right? So yes, data, data federation. So, I'm just, I'm curious to know how many, how many of these techniques do you actually have used together, or how many techniques do you have used together in one federated database? So, like foreign data wrappers, whatever. Pick, pick, yep. Pick your list. I'm just kind of curious. I mean, I, I figure this is inspired by stuff that you've actually encountered and or done, and maybe, obviously, made it a little bit. How many things have I seen federated in this kind of manner? Um, at, yeah, at most I would say three or four. Um, and usually it's like a flat text file and maybe like a, uh, usually I don't see a lot of REST interface stuff, which is actually, uh, I wouldn't say surprises me, but I, I, get, I get that it's not really a great idea. I, it's, it's not really a great idea, but the thing is, data federation is obviously not a new concept. Uh, the new concept, or maybe possibly um, just a maybe overemphasized concept here is, I don't want any of the database, uh, any of the data in my database at all, uh, except for possibly optimization purposes like a materialized view, which I can throw away at any point's notice. Uh, the reason I, I say that is because you know, if you give that to your BI department, for example, they don't necessarily have to have uh, an ETL structure. They can do, still do their reports through all these stupid interfaces and uh, the 10 databases you have in your, uh, in, your, in your environment, and they can still get the results they need. Um, they can still build their star schemas. They can still do all of that other stuff. And in this case, Postgres is just a driver. Uh, foreign data wrappers, I guess in my opinion, are underutilized uh, because 
they turn Postgres into not just a database, they are literally, it's now an inter, literally an interface layer. It can provide the missing uh, SQL set interpreter to anything, uh, especially if you have uh, an available foreign data wrapper to do it. And file foreign data, foreign data wrappers, there's uh, like several native ones, and they, you know, for anything delimited by some kind of field. Uh, anything that's, you know, a very readable format that's standardized. Uh, and uh, if you don't want to bother writing an ETL system, you do this instead, make a kind of an interface with a, like a shell system, and then you can use that as a filter to go into a real Postgres target. So uh, it's, it's a way, in my opinion, to simplify your life, but also use Postgres in a way that's not really intended. Because it's most, I mean, foreign data wrappers were designed initially, or at least I hope, <laughs> to get data into Postgres where it should live. Because obviously that's where all data should end up is in Postgres, right? Um, but in, in this manner, you know, we've got existing corporate engines, right, and a bunch of other stuff that depends on data flow. And now Postgres can be part of that data flow without actually storing any of the information itself. And that's uh, an edge case that I've never actually seen, but I'd like to. So maybe I'm just advocating it, I guess. Well, yeah, I can see lots of, you know, in a production database, let's, let's say a transactional database, this all might be a little bit crazy. But like an example from, I worked for a company that did a lot of research. Mm -hmm. Research data? Surveys, and we bring surveys in the database. And of course, the first, or this game is a big spreadsheet, right? It's like 5,000 columns. So the first thing I do is normalize it. Mm -hmm. and it goes to research people batty because they're like trying to, now they have to basically pivot this thing to make any sense of it or whatever. And I refuse to load those things in the database because they took up a bunch of room. But if I could have just had a foreign data wrapper, this is before the days of foreign data wrappers, unfortunately. But if I could have had that, then I should say, fine, here's your spreadsheet. Deal with it. Yep. You know, this, this is, you know, if you really want to go query that thing, here's your spreadsheet in table form, off in some schema someplace where it, the ETL can completely ignore it, and great. Mm -hmm. Why not? And, and I'm sure that actually would have made them quite happy, even though it's, you know, from my perspective, it'd be an abomination. Yeah, so for the benefit of any, for the one person that watches this video later, um, the, the uh, so the example, the example, the example we have here is a, uh, an instance where there's like lots of uh, questionnaires and things coming in from various resources and, you know, Thousands of these things, all of different formats, columns, whatever. Uh, they're just spreadsheets, and you know, what do you do with that? Do you give the, do you normalize it and then make it in a format that makes sense on a database, or you just give it back to them by creating the things you know raw in the database? Well, you don't want to do that because we're DBAs and that would hurt us physically. So, you know, why not just give them access to what they sent to the system, but in a format they understand by just making an interface layer for it. They can inter they can uh, interact with in a way that doesn't hurt us and it's not physically in the database. Uh, in that case, Postgres would facilitate the usage of the data without actually tainting itself with the data? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, Yep. Yeah, so. You can do it as a, uh, like making that into a table. Yeah. I appreciate, you know, obviously this is a little tongue in cheek, but a, a, a table that seems weird, a function maybe. Yeah, the, other, the other problem that you might run into, and this is probably why you also don't do the rest too much. Um, if you, let's say that you created your, you had your unnormal, your bad address, and you created a new ETU called cleanse address. That update is going to be re a really long running query, and so you're going to have this you know, basically going to be locked and loaded for a long period of time. So you have to materialize it yeah. to be able to think. Yes, reaching out to external resources during live transactions is does have the possible um, detriment of causing ex uh, extra long locking.
No comment. <laughs> so what I, what I will say, though, is I actually, um, thinking back on this, I have a real world scenario where this happened, um, where I actually had to do something like this. So who here has heard of PsyD, uh, PsyDB? It's uh, another actual project by Stonebreaker who made Postgres. Uh, it was, it's a scientific database that's meant specifically for another use of set theory, but it's got a weird query language that I never really wrapped my head around. Uh, you actually have to write out the set theory, and it's kind of like writing JSON. It's like, wh like what's going on here? Um, so it has its own access method, and I was like, okay, how do I get a hold of this? Uh, I don't know how to write this whatever language. So I found their data access method shim, which made a HTTP, um, made it available by HTTP. Then I wrote a foreign data wrapper to access it. And then I wrote a um, Postgres table to uh, map the thing I was trying to access. And suddenly I had the ability to query this thing that I wouldn't have been able to touch otherwise. It was a vector database. And I have no idea how to access vector databases. And now I can. And I used it to join against a couple of Postgres tables because it was a huge financial institution. And we already had some, uh, uh, tables that were laid to that that were imported through other means um, through the non-scientific uh, interpreter. And I was able to combine those in ways that were handy to me and handy to anyone who you know, could use the data in that, in that manner. And again, that data was not in my system. Uh, but making it empty, I guess, would be the extreme version. <laughs> but I could have. I could have made a wrapper for both the Postgres side and the SideDB side and said, given it to you know, some other you know, third party and been like, okay, here's the data, use it to your, to your whims. And it, it, I could give that to, to, to developers, uh, anyone who might need access to it, and various ACLs to make sure that that stays that way. And they don't have to have you know, access to any of our stuff directly. So speaking of foreign data wrappers, they're great, it seems like, to pull something in one-time use research, things like that, which Sam talked about earlier too, all of those things, but to say that you have it for a production ETL, the most you could ever take away is pretty much the trash, because what you're talking about, if you actually took away an ETL process and just made it all foreign data wrappers, you don't control the master at all. You have no control over if somebody wants to archive the data, remove it, drop it. Right, so you, you, have, no access, you have no control over the, the, uh, the master of the data, and that's true. Right. So but that's, 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 true, that's, that's true in a lot of ETL purposes as well. Um, like if you're pulling in the data, um, Whatever happens to that data while you're pulling it in or after you pull it in is, is immaterial. The idea here is to replace ETL in this particular instance is what you would do is you would create the interface layer, uh, you'd make select statements as your ETL, and in theory you'd pass it along to some other long-term storage system like an OLAP, uh, Postgres database you've got sitting around that's like 60 terabytes in size just accumulating data from wherever. And you would use this as your ETL tool. Postgres becomes your ETL tool because all the foreign data wrappers kind of uh, wrap and translate the data for you, uh, and then you put them in their correct target. It would seem a step, I mean, there's, I've written a lot of ETL stuff that like the first step was to uh, load the file into an unlock table so mm -hmm. you work with it. Yep. Right, outside of And this, table, this kind of, that step's automatic, table. it's the data's Here, in the table. You just have to file all the SDW, really whatever it is, and you load the data in that way, and you never have to, which unlock tables are pretty efficient, but it's nicer to not have to yeah, I question that same thing though, is that bringing it into your own table that's there and stuff, you can index it, you can control it, you can put it on faster guess, whatever it may be. In other words, if you just join across to whatever that wrapper is that has it somewhere else, you're beholden to whatever that wrapper is. Right, but that's where, that's where the, that, sorry, the bringing the data in is where the materialized views come in. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you take one kind of snapshot to create the thing and then you can interact with it any way you want. Well, I say it's. I say I say I lied in the beginning where I say it wasn't really empty, but ephemeral data to me means empty because I can truncate it when I'm done. I don't care about it after I'm done doing whatever work I did. In this case, if I'm using it to replace ETL, I temporarily load it and do stuff with it and throw it away at the end because it doesn't matter to me. My database is still empty. Yeah, it's 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 basically a cache at that point. You were. Mm -hmm. um, database, um, but that doesn't necessarily replace ETL, and that's because it's exactly what you just said. Um, if that data disappears, or what, for whatever reason, connection goes down, you have no yep. control over it, which is always the problem with ETL too, right? That you don't have control over it. 
Yeah, you can vanish at any time, that's correct. However, the second way that the things happen that we've implemented is that you create the, um, uh, or a table, for example, as a, like a multi that is mm -hmm. and then you want to import and pull the data and then put it in a, I don't know, CSV exports into an import, or have it in ETL, like export an ETL. So it's kind of what Chris is saying, like we use both just as an ETL tool, but you do, I, I think that's one thing that Technically, do need that intermediate storage of your data somewhere, whether that's in Postgres or, or whether you're right. for, just taking both this somewhere else and then throw it away. In for, for putting it in Postgres this way, you, you, you would want to at least uh, instantiate it once. The only time where I say that's not, not, that's not necessary is when I say you're handing out like the shell database to like the BI department or some other thing where they're querying your existing stack. Say you've got like a, a federation of like 10 Postgres databases all in different locations that are controlled, and say maybe they're using this as an interface layer to pull in data and you've already replaced your ETL stack, but now you have to combine all of them uh, once it's stable. And well, it, you can either import them again into some other third party location, or you can just make a shell database that spans all of them and lets you select all. Yeah, it 100% depends on the use case, right? Mm -hmm. And the use cases are an, uh, manifold and infinite, and which is kind of why I wanted to point out, like. And they probably also change all the time. Yes. So once you've decided on something, like, there's a new use case. Right? And actually, I don't know if it was um, Innova or another company, actually, they wrote uh, a system that does exactly this um, for their foreign uh, resources, because they were having problems with uh, data shifting, and they wanted to make sure that they could have access to data that was vanishing. So what they did is they wrote a uh, materialized, no, not, it wasn't even, it wasn't even a materialized view. They actually would just select portions of the data, ship and put it into a, um, an intermediate table that would just would time shift along with their information. So if they ever lost connection with their foreign data wrapper, they still had a, a rolling snapshot of what was going on. Wow. And it was, all, it was all automated with functions and triggers and stuff. And um, they had a, uh, a ticker that ran through a um, background process that they had uh, invoked. And they basically had a stable, materialized view of their entire data uh, architecture that shifted along with the day, and if they ever lost a connection to anywhere, it would still be okay until the connection came back. It would just be a little lagged. Which is a really cool use case. I, I wish I could build something like that, but I didn't have enough time for just the presentation purposes. I think our time is up. Yep. All right. Thanks for coming by. Uh, hopefully you weren't too bored.